for joining us tonight. Tonight we welcome Montana State Senator Mike Phillips, Colorado Farm Bureau Vice President Sean Martini, and moderator Rob Levine. I'm Claire Noble, and on behalf of Chris Sable, the Executive Director of the Vail Symposium, Dale Mosier, our board chairman, and the entire Vail Symposium board, welcome. Convening locally, thinking globally has been our motto for almost the entire 49 years of our existence. And although we can't convene locally tonight, as we had planned when we scheduled this program, we are grateful that you've chosen to convene with us online. Two items before we get started. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see an option for Q&A. And that's where you'll type your questions for tonight's speakers. I'll share those with the speakers throughout the program. I would ask that you keep them as concise as possible, and we'll try to get to as many as time permits. Tonight's program will run until 7 p.m. It's being recorded, and you'll be able to find that recording at veilsymposium.org. I'd like to take a moment to thank the organizations and individuals who helped make tonight's program possible. Our sponsors include the Town of Vail, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, the Antlers the at Vail, and the Vail Daily. Our virtual programs are sponsored by Alpine Bank. The summer season is underwritten by Cindy Ingalls and Leela and Walt Misher. The Environmental Awareness Series is underwritten by Holly and Buck Elliott. And tonight's program is underwritten by Carol and Mark Slatkoff. The Vail Symposium is supported by a generous grant from the Frechette Family Foundation. Our virtual programs are sponsored by Alpine Bank, and funding has been provided to the Vail Symposium by Colorado Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act Economic Stabilization Plan 2020. If you're a Vail Symposium donor, thank you. If you're not but would like to be, please visit veilsymposium.org to donate. I want to mention two programs we have coming up and that will complete our summer season, which will have included 25 programs. On Thursday, October 22nd at 9 a.m., one of our rare morning programs, we will put on the State of the Valley. It will be moderated by Chris Romer of the Vail Valley Partnership. And this program will include business and government leaders from around the valley. We'll be joined by Jeff Schroll, who is the Eagle County Manager, Phil Qualman, who is the Superintendent of Eagle County Schools, Will Cook, the CEO of Vail Health, and Vail Mountain Chief Operating Officer, Beth Howard. And then our last program will be on November 11th. And this is a program where we welcome Melanie Kirkpatrick of the Hudson Institute. The program is Thanksgiving, the holiday at the heart of the American experience. And November 11th is not a random date. It actually marks 400 years since the arrival of the Mayflower at Plymouth. Tonight, we turn our attention to ballot proposition 114, the reintroduction of the gray wolf to Colorado. We're honored to have with us Sean Martini. He's the vice president of advocacy for the Colorado Farm Bureau. Sean Martini works to cultivate relationships and with community, political, and business leaders to achieve CFB's goals in agriculture, wildlife, public lands, water, and many other areas of public policy of critical interest to rural Colorado. His family farms and ranches in Colorado and South Dakota and previously in California. Senator Mike Phillips was the field coordinator for the Red Wolf Recovery Program he served as project leader for the wolf restoration effort to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. He entered politics in 2006 through election to the Montana legislature as the representative for House District 66, Bozeman. Shortly thereafter, he founded the Montana Legislative Climate Change Caucus. He played a critical role in crafting and passing the nation's most comprehensive law for sequestering CO2 in geological formations. He was reelected to the State House in 2010 and to the State Senate in 2012. Rob Levine grew up in Littleton, Colorado. Since graduating from Colorado College in 1978, he has worked continuously for 40 plus years at the Antlers at Vail condominiums as general manager from 1987 to 2016, and he continues to serve as a consultant. Rob has been a licensed real estate broker since 1986. He served for four years on the Vail Town Council 
and has served on the boards of Bravo, Vail Music Festival, Vail's Economic Advisory Council, and the Colorado Mountain College Foundation. He also chaired Vail's Tourism Bureau, now the Vail Valley Partnership, the Vail Symposium, and Colorado State Chamber of Commerce. I'm gonna turn the program over to Rob, and just one more plug, if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Rob? Thank you, Claire. Thank you so much, and good job. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm honored to, to, to host this or to moderate it. Uh, I would like to, uh, to thank my fellow board members and, and everyone that supports the Vail Symposium for making this possible. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, a little bit out of order. Uh, I, the questions will come later. The, the format will be that I will ask uh, both Mike and Sean each for about a five minute, uh, give or take, uh, entry, uh, uh, statement and uh, position statement. And then uh, we'll get right into some questions. I've got a couple, Claire's got a couple, and we'll take some from the audience. But I'm immediately going to get out of sync. And I see the very first question that popped up was, why is this issue on the ballot? Shouldn't it be done by the legislature and the governor? And that's one that I know even I can answer. Uh, it was an initiative. Uh, the Colorado uh, State uh, Statutes call, allow for initiatives from uh, the population. And uh, proponents of this uh, ba pro uh, ballot issue, Proposition 114, uh, garnered, I believe, 135,000 signatures from around the state. And there are uh, regulations and rules on uh, how those have to come in and where they have to come in from. Uh, they successfully put it on the ballot. So uh, it was uh, unlike a, a, a ballot measure that's, that comes from the legislature, it came from the population. Uh, that said, uh, one other uh, uh, disclosure, I, I just want to share for what it's worth that uh, I find myself, I, I, I uh, consider myself a pretty rabid environmentalist. And my initial uh, feelings about this ballot issue was absolutely I'm going to vote for it without question. I'll be honest and tell you that uh, what little I've learned, and I'm looking forward to learning more tonight, but what little I've learned over the, the course of the last uh, couple of weeks have made me question that. And um, to tell you the truth, I'm a little bit ambivalent right now. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to vote. So uh, I'll appreciate listening to Sean and make his points of, of why it may not be the best proposal and listening to Mike of why it is. And uh, hopefully, along with all of our audience, uh, come to an informed conclusion. Um, why don't we start with uh, Mike? We'll go alphabetically and before us. And uh, Mike, uh, take it away. Give us five minutes uh, of uh, your thoughts on Proposition 114. Well, Rob, thank you. It, it, it's an honor to be here with you and Sean and, and all the folks that are listening. I really very much appreciate the opportunity. In short, Proposition 114 allows Coloradans to take politicians out of the picture, out of the picture concerning wolf restoration and direct the scientists at Colorado Parks and Wildlife to use the, the best science they can assemble with public input to use reintroductions to restore an important part of Colorado's natural balance. That, and, and in the essence, is what Proposition 114 is all about. Now, in the introduction, uh, it wasn't mentioned, I had the high honor of leading the Yellowstone Wolf Restoration Project. And we know from that work uh, there in Yellowstone, we released about uh, 31 wolves. Uh, 31, 40, a small number would be needed in Colorado to give rise to a viable population. Also, Rob, your history of 114 was a bit short, pal. Uh, this actually goes back to about 1995. Uh, there has been uh, hard work in place since 1995 to move the issue of wolf recovery in Colorado forward. Uh, after 18 years of hard work, it was apparent that the United States Fish and Wildlife Service was not going to discharge their duties under the Federal Endangered Species Act to bring the gray wolf back to Colorado where it belongs. And that then began this effort to build a state-based approach, an approach that would be developed by Coloradans for Coloradans to address an important conservation objective, using wolf reintroductions to restore an important part of the natural balance. This has been a long time coming it's based on great science that's been assembled over decades. 
tonight when I speak about the science that allows our understanding of gray wolf biology and restoration options of relevance to Colorado, the folks should know that the gray wolf is one of the most intensively studied mammals in the world. We know a lot about gray wolves. We have a very good idea what would take place if 30 or 40 or 50 wolves are reintroduced across 17 million acres of federal public wildlands in the western half of the state. So in short, in closing, Rob, Proposition 114 is all about Coloradans taking politicians out of the picture and enabling Colorado Parks and Wildlife to use the best science with public input to safely and effectively reintroduce a small number of gray wolves across 17 million acres of federal public lands in the western half of the state to restore an important part of natural balance. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Sean? Sure. Thank you, Rob. You hear me? You bet. All right. I uh, appreciate the introduction. I uh, appreciate the, the, the chance to be with you and all the viewers here tonight. Uh, certainly, it was good uh, in your initial comments that we at least have one person whose mind we might change this evening. <laughs> there's, there's that to build on. Um, you know, it, it's, it's weird uh, and unfortunate that in, in 2020, in this horrible year that we are having, uh, that Colorado voters are faced with such a silly ballot initiative. Uh, and, and it really is silly. We, we, we have a lot of crazy things on our ballot in Colorado every year. People know this. Um, there's, there's all sorts of crazy ideas that get put on. Uh, and and this, this one, you know, certainly takes the cake this season. Um, you, you know, it's, it, it's, it's unfortunate for a number of reasons, not least of which because the same wildlife agency um, that the senator wants to empower with the ability to manage this program already has that ability. Uh, in fact, they've decided four times in the past, going back to 1982, again in 85, 2005, and most recently in 2016, under a Governor Hickenlooper administration and who, in consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife that was being run by President Obama, uh, decided that they looked at the preponderance of the evidence. They looked at the best science available uh, of the most studied species, as Senator Phillips mentioned. Uh, and they made the determination that it wasn't right for the state of Colorado. Look, we've got an incredibly populous state. We've got three times as many people uh, in Colorado as in the Northern Rocky states alone. Um, we've got a lot of protected and endangered wildlife species in this state. And our Parks and Wildlife Agency uh, does a fantastic job trying to manage all the disparate populations and industries uh, and groups of people and other species and how they interact with each other in making sure that we can recover as many threatened and endangered species as possible. We have a really good track record of doing it. We have one of the best parks and wildlife agencies in the country, hands down. Anybody will tell you that. They've done a really good job managing the species thus far, taking the evidence into account, and making a decision that's best, not just for the ecosystems and for the individual populations in Colorado, but also for our economy and the people who live on the Western Slope, the people who live near the public lands uh, that Senator Phillips talked about, but also the people uh, who own private land and manage that private land on a daily basis to the benefit of our wildlife populations in this state. You know, the Senator talked about taking politicians out of the equation. It's interesting that the lead spokesman for this initiative is a state senator from another state, not even from Colorado. And the funders of that organization who are pushing that initiative are by and large from San Francisco, Washington, DC, and New York. Look, this is not an issue that Coloradans were clamoring to, to, to vote about. Uh, there's no dramatic problem uh, with our wildland areas in the state of Colorado, at least not ones that can't be fixed by the tools that our excellent state wildlife managers have available to them already. And I think the person who initiated the conversation and asking about why this is on the ballot uh, really hit on something important. It shouldn't be on the ballot. Uh, it's on the ballot because out of state interests, uh, including the Senator, um, spent a lot of time and donors money getting signatures from people up and down the 16th street mall to put this thing on the ballot and do a complete end run around the established process that in other states has been successful at introducing the wolf. Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and in New Mexico. And in this one area, they've said both 
federal and, and state wildlife officials have said it's not a good idea. And so we have an end run around that process, putting it on the ballot and making what should be, again, a collaborative and science driven process, one driven by politics. And so for those reasons, we're asking for a, a vote uh, to vote no on Proposition 114. Very good. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'm going to actually, uh, throughout, the, throughout the next uh, 45 minutes, I'll ask each of you or offer each of you the, uh, the option, the ability to respond to comments by the other. Uh, and in that vein, Mike, uh, did anything Sean say uh, spur a response? <laughs> Oh, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy. There's a whole lot to unpack there and it's mostly because uh, he was just wrong on, on the facts. Uh, for example, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has never developed a proposal to reintroduce gray wolves. The commission has decided. The commission is not CPW. CPW is, is staffed by professional biologists. The commission in contrast are nominated by governors and confirmed by the Senate. They're citizens that do other things besides think about fish and wildlife resources. Yeah, the fact that Colorado has a lot of folks on the front range, well, if you're really willing to look at the issue of habitat suitability, Western Colorado represents the best unoccupied wolf habitat in the world. There's a human density in Western Colorado that's less than the Northern Rocky Mountains, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan far more humanized than Colorado support 6,000 gray wolves, thousands of gray wolves in European countries that are far more humanized. In terms of Colorado support, uh, I understand the Rocky Mountain Wolf Action Fund has received contributions from over 4,000 Coloradans. And, and Rob, when you mentioned the petitioning process, your numbers were wrong, pal, I, I hate to correct you, but 215,370 signatures were collected on behalf of the ballot measure to ensure that voters could see it in 2020. Uh, there have been conservation organizations, including Colorado Voters for Animals and their 40,000 followers that support Proposition 114. And then why would someone like me from Montana be involved? Well, I am, uh, uh, and you might be surprised, but the world's leading expert on wolf recovery and reintroductions I've done more of this work than anybody in the country. And as a state legislator for 14 years, I understand the legal aspects well too, but more to the point, the landscape of relevance to wolf restoration in Colorado is the 17 million acres of federal public lands. The White River National Forest in Colorado is just as much my national forest as the Gallatin National Forest in Montana is yours. And finally, the gray wolf protected by federal law. As a citizen of this country, the federal laws matter to me. So I have the opportunity to be concerned about wolf recovery under the Endangered Species Act. So I have every right and responsibility in the world to engage on behalf of this particular issue. But the listeners should be well aware this is a Colorado-based effort grown by Coloradans maintained by Coloradans. I sit as an advisor because I understand the conservation and political science as well. Very good. Well stated and thank you for correcting me. Sean? Look, you know, it's it, you know, to the question of population, right? Um, I, I don't think there's anybody who has driven up the I-70 corridor uh, and would mistake the communities along that area for anything resembling Cody, Wyoming and Yellowstone National Park. Uh, they're two completely different places and simply assuming that the science that shows wolf introduction has been successful in Yellowstone National Park, where by the way, park officials don't have the same kinds of tools that Colorado wildlife officials have to manage wildlife populations is the same as the state of Colorado is simply silly, it's, it's not science. Uh, it's comparing apples to oranges. Uh, you know, we talk about 17 million acres of the White River National Forest and the public land in Colorado. We do all own that public land. Uh, all of us do. All of us around the country do. The problem is the wolves aren't just going to stay on public land. The wolves are going to impact private land as well and the industry and the people who live in the communities all around Western Colorado. And that's not the kind of thing that this ballot initiative takes into consideration. It is the kind of thing that the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission have to take into consideration alongside 
the best science that we have on this species and alongside the expert experience of game wardens across the state of Colorado and people who work at Colorado Parks and Wildlife's head office doing the research. Uh, the entire reason that we have citizens appointed to make these decisions, weigh the preponderance of the evidence and make decisions on what's best for the state of Colorado and what's best for the wildlife management in the state of Colorado is to make it non-political. And the appointees <clears throat> on that commission have been appointed by both Republican and Democratic governors in the state of Colorado. That's the entire point in making it bipartisan and apolitical. And here we have a process that makes it entirely political. Saying that the, support, the supporters of this initiative are okay when those same bodies decide to introduce wolves in the Northern Rockies and in New Mexico, but somehow they don't like that process when that process finds against them in one state, in Colorado. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, I can I jump in, Rob. I, I think it's important that sure, Mike. people understand the facts. Uh, and I'm I'm surprised that Sean doesn't know this, but apparently he doesn't. Uh, this is not an issue for the commission. Wolf restoration is not an issue for the game commission or CPW. Years ago, your general assembly passed a bill that was signed into law. Everybody can go find it, Colorado Revised Statute, 33-2-105, subsection 2, makes clear that the issue of gray wolves is resolved by the General Assembly. By its very nature, it is a political process. Last time I looked, the General Assembly was populated by politicians. Now, as a 14-year state legislator, I can tell you folks, Legislators don't often get it right and don't often do what, what needs to be done. There has been plenty of opportunity for the legislature to engage, and they haven't. Now, there was an effort back in 2000, the early part of 2020, for the legislature to do that, but it was sidetracked by the pandemic. But folks, no, don't mistake what's going on here. It is already a political issue. Colorado Revised Statute 33-2-105.5, subsection 2, makes clear this decision rests with the General Assembly. All 114 does is serve as a framework for Coloradans to aspire to have gray wolves as part of the future or not. And if they do aspire, 114 lays out very few specifics for how CPW will exercise the very best science to achieve that aspiration. And Rob, before the evening ends, please, let's talk about what specifically does 114 say, because I think folks will be surprised by its simplicity and its emphasis on allowing the scientists to do their job. It, it is interesting. I think it's a credit to our legislators that, in fact, they recognize that uh, a politicized process by running uh, legislation to do so or putting in front of the voters would not be a good idea and have instead deferred the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission to make those kinds of decisions. Yep. They've been told in the past four separate times by that commission and the experts that they have access to that it's not a good idea have been, and so have not chosen to act themselves through a political process to introduce that species. Thank you, Sean. Bob, let me let me Bob, switch gears you, here. Bob, yeah, Bob, let me switch. Would you mind if I pop in with a, an audience question? Uh, that would be great, Claire. Thank you. And and this comes from Allie, and she asks, uh, "What have the wildlife experts said about whether or not this is a good idea?" And as she said, this feels like a political discussion, but many of people have joined this program tonight to learn about the science. So if we could just shift gears and it's fine if we come back to the politics of, of 114 again, but could we take a moment to look at the science? What is the science saying about why this is a good idea or not a good idea? Thank you, Claire. And I was, uh, but before you do, Sean, I was, uh, funny, I was just about to go in that direction and, and have a couple of uh, follow-up questions or, or maybe embedded questions. Uh, Mike, in your initial comments, you talk about the gray wolf being the most studied animal and, and us knowing, you knowing exactly how it'll play out. And I want to hear about that. I mean, if we introduce 30 or 40 wolves, 
how many will there be in 10 years? How many will there be in 20 years? How big will the, the pack get? Um, where do we expect them to be? As Sean said, they're not going to just stay on public lands. So uh, how does that work and what does that look like? Um, but as as, uh, as Claire suggested, let's let's talk about the, sort of the implementation and, and the science of it. And we may come back to the politics if we have time, although uh, our time is short. But uh, let's go in that direction for for a bit. Yes. Sure, Sean. Right. Thanks. It's interesting that. that question was asked because um, that's actually one of the conceits about putting this on the ballot and making it political and doing an end run around the current processes that we have established in the state of Colorado is that by making it political we take the state officials who are experts in this area completely out of the game and we can't hear from them. You have to take the proponent's word for it, that the science is good, that everything would be the same here in Colorado under an introduction program, the same as it was in Yellowstone or in other states. Because it's political, because it's on the ballot and it's part of an election, state agencies are not allowed to say anything. They're muzzled and they're sat on the bench. And they're the ones who need to be driving this process, but unfortunately they can't. So you have to take the word of science from other states uh, and, and, and assume that that is going to be the exact thing that would happen here in the state of Colorado. That's, that's the unfortunate part about this entire thing. And now voters are tasked here tonight with trying to parse the science one way or another. And that's why they should say no to the entire thing, leave it up either to the legislator, legislature uh, or to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission who have the access to the science and the experts available to make this decision. And again, in the past, they've said it's not a good idea four separate times in a bipartisan way. And so that's, that's why it's, it's really unfortunate that they're not able to speak for themselves in this issue. And Parks and Wildlife has said as much in their interviews on this subject here over the past few months. Thank you, Sean. Uh, given your, your uh, biology background, Mike, uh, why don't you... Uh, yeah, well, once again, Sean, I'm sorry, pal, to correct you, but CPW has never uh, studied this issue in detail, but there's a great deal of peer-reviewed science. And it doesn't matter that the peer-reviewed science was done in Minnesota or Montana or Arizona. The peer-reviewed science has application to Colorado. We know from a paper I published in a prestigious journal that the quality of habitat in Western Colorado was outstanding. There is no doubt that Western Colorado with so over 17 million acres of federal public lands and over 700,000 deer and elk left on the ground after recreational hunters have killed on average about 80,000. There is an abundance of native prey. So you have this fantastic land base that's populated by robust numbers of native prey in the absence of human caused mortality. Gray wolves would do very well in Western Colorado. Now, Rob, you asked about the mechanics, probably. If Governor Polis asked me, I'd say, Governor, uh, you can let 30 or 40 animals go using the Idaho model. You take them to Southern Colorado from Montana or Idaho and you let them go at the end of a logging road. Uh, you do that 30 or 40 times. Uh, that would be the end of the reintroduction phase. They would do well enough. They would find one another. They would give birth to puppies. And within about a decade, Rob, you could easily imagine a population of gray wolves in Western Colorado that was 100 strong. And maybe 10 years later, it'd be about 200 strong. What ultimately would reside in Western Colorado would be a function of the sensibilities of Coloradans as expressed in CPW's management plan. Now, where would gray wolves end up? They would end up where they could be uh, secure and safe and successful. If you look at Colorado's existing wolf management plan, it says gray wolves are welcome wherever they want to go so long as they don't cause problems. As it turns out, gray wolves typically don't cause problems. But when they do, when they do, they're easy to manage. They evolved as the big dog on the block. So they're, they're very obvious in what they do. They have big feet, they have skillets for feet. So they leave easily uh, distinguished tracks. They're large animals, they're relatively easy to see at 60, 70, 80 pounds. They're social, so they occur in groups, four, five, six, animals together. They howl at night. They're easy to keep track of. When there's a problem, problems are easily resolved. And, and, and there's a, a bevy of good techniques available for preventing conflicts from ever occurring in the first place. If you are willing to take an objective look at the gray wolf, as defined by decades of reliable research, 
you conclude that coexisting with the species is a very straightforward affair that requires only a modicum of accommodation. Let me ask a follow-up question in that regard. Uh, in, my, uh, in my admitted ignorance, I've, I've often thought that uh, one of the, the biggest uh, problems with reintroduction is the taking of livestock. And clearly that's, I'm sure, uh, what some of the predisposition against the measure would be from ranchers and, and the ag community. Um, I understand that Prop 114 uh, allows for compensation for ranchers and farmers if they lo do lose livestock. I've also read, take it for what it's worth, that that's sometimes not easily determined. Um, livestock isn't, uh, well, it can be uh, confusing and uh, there's at least some sense of uh, concern that, that some livestock will get lost that will not be compensated for. Your comments might uh, make it seem almost too easy to manage, um, but can you address that and how that's worked in other states, and and how much you know, uh, how much it winds up costing in terms of compensation, how yeah. many how much livestock can we expect to lose? Um, we, we can we can Rob. It's a great question and it allows me to point to the out to the the, the viewers. Proposition 114 only offers three very specific things. It really does stand as a framework for. Coloradans to aspire to gray wolves as part of the future or not. Here are the specifics. It says CPW will develop a science-based plan with public input. That's specific one. Specific two, they will implement that plan starting by 31 December 2023. Three years, one month, and seven days, 27 days after the election, they'll implement. The third specific, and this gets to your question, CPW will respect the ranchers. They will do their very best to make ranchers whole. Now, how, how do you do that? Well, you acknowledge that some depredations, which are uncommon, it is the atypical wolf that kills livestock. Coloradans could expect about 50, 60 head of cattle to be depredated on livestock every year uh, out of uh, a great deal of uh, livestock, well over a million in the state. But, but, you know, if they're your cattle that got killed last night, you've got a problem. Fortunately, we've got tools at the ready for resolving conflicts when they arise. There's good tools at the ready for preventing conflicts from ever occurring. Wolf depredations do not represent a threat to the industry. And when they threaten a particular rancher, there's good management tools at the ready to ensure that the problem is resolved. This, the gray wolves are just not the problem people imagine them to be. And, and in part, Rob, you know, the only problem for wolf recovery has been the mythical wolf. People have this mythical sense that the wolf has supernatural abilities to exercise its predatory will on a whim. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Unfortunately, the myth is as wrong as it is strong. And, and I, I, I hate to say, uh, um, Sean, I believe that to some extent you're perpetuating the myth tonight. The facts tell us, decades of facts collected from other states in this country, that are actually more humanized than Western Colorado. Coexisting with the gray wolf is a straightforward affair that requires only a modicum of accommodation. Proposition 114 allows voters to take politicians out of the picture, instruct CPW to use the best science with public input to go forward to restore the natural balance. Thank you, Mike. Sean, do you have a response? Yeah, thank you, are uh, over. Who's playing it, Mike? Look, I mean, it's all easy to say uh, when you're not a rancher, it's not your cattle that are getting killed, especially when we have all the science that says all the great things that you say the wolf does, and it's so easy to manage, and it's so easy to deal with. You'd think it would be done in this state by now. If it was that simple, if it was such a layup, the legislature would have acted, Parks and Wildlife would have acted in concert with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because this remains an endangered species. And in fact, they haven't because it's not an appropriate place to do it. As you mentioned, introduction has been successful. We've got a huge population of wolves in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. You, you mentioned they introduced only just a few, a couple dozen uh, into that state. And, and now there are thousands, right? What difference does it make? What side of a political boundary that wolf lives on? Oh, well, it matters to the federal law and it matters to state law. 
and, and, and there was a reintroduction in Idaho that went forward that gave rise to the Northern Rockies population. It was successful because gray wolves are relatively easy to work with. There's good ways to go forward. Rob, you had asked about what do you do in the presence of a depredation. It is hard to document all losses, so you include an adjustment factor. You know, maybe you pay four times the value of any head of livestock lost. There's also this concern that livestock don't gain the weight that they should. Well, there's some good data from Montana that illustrates that sometimes the case, not always, but sometimes. So you can also adjust upward with compensation to account for weight, not gain. But, but the fact is folks, it's always difficult for ranchers to ensure the survival of their animals, especially on public land with sufficient weight gain before sending the animals to slaughter for profit. Gray wolves aren't gonna make that any more difficult for the vast majority of ranchers in Colorado. There is widespread support for this among Coloradans. Sean makes a good point. It's curious that the United States Fish and Wildlife Service has not moved on this issue. I would have you believe they had to get other things done first. The work in the Great Lakes states had to be done first. The work in the Northern Rocky Mountains had to be done first. The Mexican wolf program in the border country of Arizona, New Mexico, and Mexico had to be done. When the service was ready to move on Colorado for political reasons, move forward by Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico, not the citizenry, but politicians, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service stood down. That was about 2013. That gave rise to the effort that has built Proposition 114 to let the, the voters of Colorado decide are gray wolves part of the future or not? Thank you, Mike. Uh, let me ask a, a different question. Um, talk about, let's talk about the economics of it. Um, as I understand it, there's a fiscal note associated from the uh, Colorado Legislative, Legislative Council that estimates the cost of this program will be on the order of three or $400,000 in the first year, and then slightly more than that in following years. Um, granted, that's not a king's ransom in the context of the state budget. On the other hand, in these times of COVID, uh, everybody is cutting their budget. And there is a lack of funds for everything from highways to schools. And although a half a million dollars a year, as I said, is an enormous, and uh, I'm sure Michael will make the case that it's worth it. Let's talk about that. I'm curious, for my own education, how does that get spent? Uh, I'm sure some of it's on uh, to pay for the science that you're talking about that the CPW commission will in fact use to, to create the program. And obviously some of it's for that compensation for the, uh, for the taking of livestock. Uh, do you know from experience, uh, Mike, or do you know, have some thoughts, Sean, about uh, the, uh, the relative amounts of that and what other costs there are and any feelings about the economics of this program, Sean? Yeah, well, you know, the, the fiscal note is a couple hundred thousand dollars from Legislative Council. We should note that it's on the order of, of six million dollars or more, according to Colorado Parks and Wildlife's own, uh, own study of the issue. Um, and so at a time when the state is losing billions of dollars, we're entertaining going around the process and going around our wildlife experts and spending millions of dollars introducing a species that's already present in the state and is successful uh, in northern Rocky states. Uh, and as I mentioned before, doesn't really care what side of Colorado's border it is on. Uh, it's a shame that uh, we've got as many cuts as we have. Uh, we're going to debt to our own public schools as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And individual municipalities around the state uh, are losing 20, 30, 40 percent of their budget. Uh, dealing with the fallout from COVID-19 and in the middle of all this, we're presented with a question politicizing the science and going around the established processes that we have for introducing wildlife into the state of Colorado. Well, thank yeah, you, thank you, Sean. Yeah, that, it's yeah, li life is politics, pal. Uh, just the nature of the beast. But back to the specific question about the economics. Political, Mike. I thought this wasn't yeah. politics. This is science. A lot, life is politics. It, it, you know, just uh, I am willing to admit that electoral politics is political. However. If you'd be willing to take an objective look at 114, perhaps read it, uh, you'd in, you know that it simply establishes a framework for Coloradans to decide whether they aspire for wolves to be part of the future or not. But back to the question, I understand the fiscal note. I think it's accurate for the first 
couple of years, implementation will be slightly more expensive. Uh, I could easily imagine that implementation in Colorado could cost half a million to six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars a year. Not chump change, but for a state with a multi-billion dollar budget, it certainly can find room. Now, as it turns out, as it turns out, as long as the gray wolf is protected under federal law, and there's good reason to believe that that will be the case for a long time, uh, over 75% of the cost of wolf work in Colorado uh, would be assumed by the federal government. Now, if the federal government somehow is not involved in a permitting capacity and a funding capacity, uh, GOCO is a beautiful source of monies for imperiled species restoration project that does not come from the state's general fund. Everyone should remember the beautiful restoration work with Lynx was funded with GOCO dollars. Uh, so this doesn't have to upset the economic apple cart for Colorado, quite the contrary. It's eminently affordable and will do much to continue to buoy the notion of Colorado as a, a wild outdoor, uh, uh, a special outdoor place for Americans to come and visit and contribute to the economy. When you look at the numbers from the Northern Rocky Mountains, for example, just looking at the Grady Yellowstone ecosystem, valid economic studies make clear that gray wolves here are worth on an annual basis about $35 million a year. Now that's real money. And there could be that kind of economic benefit in the state of Colorado. This speaks nothing to the value of predation to help arrest the spread of chronic wasting disease, which has great potential to disrupt big game hunting and the economics of that industry. Moreover, we should all be mindful, chronic wasting disease has the potential to become a zoonotic disease from deer and elk to humans. But in contrast to COVID-19, which is a zoonotic disease, chronic wasting disease is always fatal. If you take an objective look, at the state's chronic wasting disease management plan. Many of the objectives that they aim to achieve to arrest CWD would be achieved naturally through wolf predation. So if you wanna cut this thing economically, it bounces on the black side of the ledger, not the red side. Thank you, Mike. Uh, another question that I've, I had personally was uh, the, the state of the, uh, the herd in the state of Colorado. As I understand it, uh, the deer herd has been shrinking uh, fairly significantly for a number of years, mostly as I understand it due to uh, human interaction, uh, human encroachment on uh, wildlife habitat. Um, clearly, uh, that's not a, that the ideal situation for bringing in uh, uh, an apex predator, um, but, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, uh, both of you. I was just going to mention, Rob, it is interesting that, that one of the reasons is because we have so many people in this state. Uh, and that's why uh, introducing another apex predator uh, that's going to interact with all of those people is really not a good idea and probably why the, both the legislature and Parks and Wildlife have declined to do that in the past. Look, uh, uh, you mentioned the fiscal note. Uh, it's easy to walk away from those numbers. We're talking you know, numbers in the millions of dollars, at least $6 million as the experts at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. The staffers, the career people who do this for a living were the ones who came up with that number, Senator, not apparently the politicians who sit on that board. Uh, and, you know, <clears throat> we're talking about a state that has, um, you know, the largest elk herd uh, in the country. That doesn't mean our elk herd is healthy everywhere. Uh, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation uh, has been a strong partner for us. Uh, in saying no to this initiative, they understand that it bypasses science and instead does an end run around it and puts it on the ballot and politicizes it. They also understand the impact that that species has had on elk herds in other states. Uh, they understand the impact that it could have in the state of Colorado, where in many game units, both the elk and deer population are under target. Yeah, well, gee whiz, here we, uh, uh, the, the $6 million, folks, is spread out over 10 years. CPW is staffed by professionals. I don't doubt that that's a good number. The fiscal note we referred to wasn't prepared by legislators, but rather by their staff. The staff for legislators is very good. They are professionals. I've had the high honor to work with legislative staff for 14 years. Those are good numbers too. But back to the issue of gray wolves and big game, here are data from CPW. 
from 2004 to 2017, their own survey data show that on average hunters kill 80,000 deer and elk every year. After that take, there remain nearly exclusively in Western Colorado, approximately 700,000 deer and elk. That is a prey population unlike anything anywhere in the world. Now, when you walk through gray wolf food habits, you can assume that a gray wolf is going to need about seven to 10 pounds of food a day. And when you walk, I can walk you through the numbers. It's not complicated. But what we conclude from that is a population of 250 gray wolves would take about 1.5% of the standing crop of deer and elk that's left after hunters have already taken their 80,000 animals. There's plenty of bounty in Colorado to go around for the recreational big game hunter and for gray wolves. Now, if you doubt that, look to the Northern Rocky Mountains, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, have lived now for decades with over a thousand gray wolves. Elk numbers in each state are up. License sales are up. Success is good. Gray wolves are secure. There's no evidence that the big game hunting apple cart has been disrupted in the Northern Rocky Mountains. If you look to the Great Lakes states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, lots of big game hunters there, still grand opportunities to hunt white-tailed deer in all three of those states, which are all more humanized than Colorado and support over 5,000 gray wolves. There simply are no data to support the claim that gray wolves will disrupt the big game recreational hunting apple cart in Colorado. Quite the contrary, if you go back to the, the, the disease issue, any hunter should be excited about a natural governor on chronic wasting disease. It is always fatal and you cannot know from the animal you've killed in the field if your deer or elk is CWD positive. Notably, the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization both advise do not eat meat from CWD positive animals. A coursing predator like a gray wolf will be a very effective governor on the spread and, and incident, the rate of chronic wasting disease in elk and deer herds in Colorado. There's simply no downside for big game hunters to share the landscape with another great hunter. That, oh, by the way, if a gray wolf comes up empty pawed, she goes home hungry. In contrast, the recreational hunter typically goes home and eats some other meal. How they can't find a kindred connection with gray wolves has always baffled me. Thank you, Mike. So, Rob, do you mind Claire? if I pop in with another audience question? Happily. A lot of people are, are asking something along these lines, and I want to go to the question from Mark Slatkoff. He says, I understand a small number of wolves are currently crossing into Colorado from Wyoming. One, is this true? And if so, what's the likelihood and timeline that they could establish a significant population on, our, on their own? And a few other people have chimed in that uh, many ranchers and farmers are okay with wolves, but as long as they establish themselves naturally as opposed to being reintroduced by the state. And I think that question is directed at Mike. Well, uh, there are good data that show there's a small number of gray wolves that have wandered into Northwestern Colorado out of Wyoming. There's no good data on how many. In, in January, February, there appeared to be six. There was one unverified report of a puppy this past summer. We know at least two animals were shot in Wyoming, just north of the Colorado border. As you think about wolves wandering into Colorado and giving rise to a viable population, note that Wyoming is a killing field for all intent and purposes across 88% of the state. Gray wolves can be shot, killed any time of the day, any time of the night, any time of the year, in any numbers, and left in the field. So there's very little potential that enough gray wolves will wander into Colorado on their own and give rise to a viable population. Moreover, and this is so very important, and is often uh, uh, glossed over by those who say gray wolves are okay if they get here on their own. People should note that animals that are reintroduced in no way compromise the survival of animals that might be here. If it's one or two or three, their survival would be buoyed by reintroduced wolves because of the attention to the wolf project. We know from previous work that when reintroductions begin, everybody's paying attention. And so knuckleheads that might wanna take matters into their own hands and poach gray wolves, I don't because they're worried about getting caught. But more importantly, under federal law, which still applies in Colorado, 
the animals that wander in naturally cannot be managed. They can be virtually, uh, they have to uh, be uh, untouched, virtually untouched in a management scheme because they're fully endangered. And that's the way federal law is written. In contrast, if you take recovery by the horns and proactively conduct reintroductions, the Federal Endangered Species Act allows you to develop a, a management plan tailored for local circumstances that allows local folks' needs and concerns to be actively addressed and respected. You gain the world with reintroductions. Coexisting with a reintroduced wolf is a great deal easier and their progeny than coexisting with a fully endangered gray wolf that's wandered in from Wyoming. Thank you, Mike. I got one real quick question. Uh, there was a bit of a disconnect. Uh, we were talking about thousands of wolves here and 5,000 wolves in Michigan. And, and yet you answered one of my initial questions by suggesting that over the course of, I thought you said about 10 years, there may be as few as a couple hundred strong uh, wolves based on the reintroduction. Uh, how do we reconcile those two numbers? Actually, uh, what I said was uh, about 100 at year 10 and maybe 200 or 250 by year 20. The, the that's, numbers that's that few. I, yeah, yeah. Well, now that's just year 20. Uh, the well, numbers that I relayed from the population, the num of feed, one would assume the, that they would be easily wait, uh, yeah. number. Let me, uh, I'll get there. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Mike. The, the numbers that I referenced 5,000, that's Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, a uh, thousand or uh, probably closer to 2,000 in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho, larger areas. Uh, in Colorado, the absolute number would be a function of Coloradans. They, they might choose to manage wolves aggressively and keep population numbers relatively low, or they might choose to manage gray wolves in a very conservative fashion, allowing the population to grow. Notably, Proposition 114 is silent on this. Proposition 114 relies on the scientists working with Coloradans to decide what the future of the gray wolf would be. All 114 speaks to is a viable population. And technically, viability would be achieved with about 100 wolves. Some of my conservation biologist friends might wish that I said 250. 250 is better than 100. But 100 wolves would be fairly considered a viable population. Sean? You know, I mean, the fact is there, there are wolves in Colorado. They've wandered in from Wyoming. Uh, there's a pup uh, that's been cited by a, a division of wildlife official, a parks and wildlife official. Um, we're asked to be voting on initiative to spend dollars in the middle of a pandemic to introduce a species that's already here. And based on what Mike is telling us, could really number in the thousands very quickly. Uh, we, we've seen it in Idaho and Wyoming and Montana, especially considering uh, the amount of feed that they have, our, our abundant elk populations. Um, even though in some areas, uh, those are below target. Uh, it's unfortunate. Um, you know, it, again, it, it, it comes down to uh, the difference between coexisting with a wolf that naturally ranges into the state uh, the way nature would have it do, uh, and, and having wolves be airdropped via the ballot box all around the state uh, if you're a rancher who's, whose animals are being predated. Look, agriculture is in the middle of about a six-year downturn in commodity prices. Uh, bankruptcies are, uh, for farm and ranches in the state of Colorado, as high as they've been in 10 years. Uh, our net farm and ranch income in this state is half of what it was five years ago. And that's before COVID-19 and the upset uh, that's been associated with historic farms and ranchers that are trying to make a living along the Western slope. Look, we wanna do what's best for the environment. We wanna do what's best for our land. You don't get four and five and six generation ranchers in the state of Colorado because you don't care about the wildlife and the land that's around you. These are extremely hard times for those same ranchers. And now they're being asked in the middle of this pandemic to have voters on the front range make a decision that they will never have to suffer the consequences for about the character of their communities and the challenges they're going to be facing on the Western Slope, on their ranches, in their towns, in the communities, in the public land where this wolf will range and cause problems. All the things that Mike is telling you about, all the, the supposed benefits that 114 provides can be currently done in the state of Colorado, either through, as he points out, the legislature or in their wisdom, they've decided to give that authority to Colorado Parks and Wildlife and defer to them because the Parks and Wildlife Commission has access to the best wildlife biologists that we have in the state and the entire body of evidence uh, that Mike mentioned already exists on the wolves. 
you know, hey, Rob, you, I, I, I got to point out that we're about out of time. So yeah, we got to run. Yeah, make it quick. I, I realize that Sean keeps coming back to this notion of the ballot box. Voters make critically important decisions all the time on complex issues. We vote for leaders. We vote for a president. We vote for a governor. We vote for senators and judges and state legislators. Uh, Coloradans have more than enough knowledge and wisdom to decide whether Great Wolf should be part of the future. You can't pick at this thing because it's an exercise of direct democracy. My Lord, direct democracy is an American, his mom, apple pie and baseball. And if the agricultural community in Colorado is struggling, Gray Wolves won't make that struggle any better or any worse. They, 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 they won't be anything but decimal dust in the, in the spreadsheets. Decimal dust, okay. Thank you, just, Thank you Mike. The, 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 the numbers just aren't there, Sean. They're just not there. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate you, your uh, faith in the Colorado's uh, uh, knowledge and education, and uh, clearly more so after this evening. Thank you. Uh, we are almost out of time. We got about three or four minutes left. Claire, do we have any uh, final questions from the audience? Well, we have a ton of questions, and I'm so sorry to all the folks who've asked questions and we're not going to be able to get to any of them. In our entire summer season, we've never had this many questions. <laughs> but Kimber asks a question that I think is important because it's one of the things you hear about in the, let's say, advertising pro 114, and that's that Colorado represents a gap in the wolf habitat. That so you have habitat north of us and habitat south of us and not habitat here. Why is it important to connect these populations of wolves? Or Sean, why is it not important? Exactly. <laughs> why don't you uh, start, Mike? Uh, let's keep it short and then uh, Sean, you can follow it. It's the only place in the world where you can imagine achieving the restoration of a large, endangered, misunderstood, much maligned carnivore across a continent from the high Arctic to northern Mexico. That is restoration magic of the finest kind. And it stands symbolically as clear evidence that we can have a different relationship with Mother Earth. And I remind everybody the extinction crisis is just that. It's growing ever more so. It should compel everyone, no matter who you are, a person of faith, you should be compelled by the extinction crisis. How can you love the creator and not love the creation? Or conversely, if you're a secular humanist, you should be compelled if you believe that rather than faith, it's logic and facts and data and empiricism that matter. Then the best science tells us the fate of humanity has always been tied to the health of local landscapes and the extinction crisis makes clear those landscapes are not healthy. This is a historic effort. Uh, I, I'm actually offended that, that Sean would describe it as a silly measure. It's not silly in the least. It, it's a grand opportunity to readjust the relationship with Mother Earth. Nothing is more important than that. And Coloradans know plenty to decide whether they aspire to reintroduce the gray wolf to restore the natural balance. Thank you, Mike. Sean, we'll give you the last word here. Look, Fish and Wildlife Service and Colorado Parks and Wildlife have talked about the fact that introducing wolves uh, into the state of Colorado is going to mess with the restoration plans that they have currently, uh, consistent with the Endangered Species Act, because in New Mexico, the Mexican gray wolf uh, is a distinct subspecies, uh, and they don't want the genetic intermingling. Colorado acts as a good geographic barrier in between the Northern Rockies and New Mexico. Uh, we have this from uh, former wildlife biologists, actually, who have sat on the Parks and Wildlife Commission and weighed this, what is available to them. Look, it's just one of another number of reasons why the species already has not been introduced in the state of Colorado, why the opportunity has come up multiple times in the past, and the officials tasked with doing the job that they do on every other species in the state of Colorado uh, to a really great degree, in this case, have said it's not a good idea. And that's what the question is uh, about tonight. It's not about whether or not you dislike the wolf or you doubt the science or whatever your objection is. Nobody's asking you to vote against the species or dislike the species. What we're asking is to not do an end run around the established processes that have been successful in introducing the species in other states that in this one case have said it's not appropriate to do it in this state and to stop focusing so much on where the species lives within a particular political boundary and more about ensuring the success of that species in the states where it's currently been introduced. It's a, it's a great and it's a fantastic thing. And if to hear Mike believe it, it doesn't cause any problems for anybody anywhere. 
But the fact is that it's going to cause problems, and it does cause problems. And to the extent that the science and the experts who've been tasked with managing this species uh, have declined to do so in the past, it's not good for us non-biologists, we don't think, to be able to say, you're doing it wrong, we know better than you, do it this way. And so that's yeah, why they're not saying no, no, they're, they're no. saying do it. They're, they're not saying do it this way. The Prop 114 says do it. Okay. I was on every Mexican wolf recovery team that was convened, Sean. Once again, you're light on facts, pal, about Canis lupus bailei, but I think that's a discussion for another webinar. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, I appreciate both of you very much. Uh, appreciate your expertise and your willingness to take the time. And thank you to our audience for taking time out of your busy schedule. And Claire, do you have any uh, final thoughts or? Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Sean and Mike, for taking time out of your lives to share it with the Vail Symposium and our audience. And to our audience, thank you for joining us this evening. I hope you'll join us for one of our two remaining programs in our 2020 summer season. We've got State of the Valley on October 22nd, and we have the History of Thanksgiving on November 11th. Good night, everyone, and thank you very much. Thank you.